Today, America's top diplomat called Israel's prime minister and the president of the Palestinian Authority, and senior U.S. officials met their counterparts in Saudi Arabia. Among the topics of focus, could two of America's closest allies in the Middle East, Israel and Saudi Arabia, normalize relations? Nick Schifrin examines the outline of a possible deal and its implications. It would be a grand bargain and create a tectonic shift in the Middle East. Israel and Saudi Arabia have never had diplomatic relations. But today, both countries' leaders appear to want normalization, and the U.S. is actively negotiating its details. The broad outline would be this. The U.S. provides Saudi Arabia security guarantees, civil nuclear technology with enrichment, and advanced weapons. And Israel provides what officials describe as, quote, meaningful concessions to the Palestinians. Here's how National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan described the possible deal late last month. Peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel would be a big deal. It would help create a circumstance in which uh, the countries of the region could collaborate on everything from economics to technology to regional security. And that would benefit the United States of America in a fundamental way because we have an interest in a more integrated, more stable Middle East where de-escalation as opposed to escalation is the order of the day. But critics have argued it could come at too high a price for not enough gain. To examine a possible deal and its implications, we get three views. Robert Satloff is the executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Bernard Haeckel is the professor of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. And Dalia Dasake is a senior fellow at the UCLA Berkle Center for International Relations. Thank you very much. Welcome to all three. Uh, Bernard Haeckel, let me begin with you. Why is this important for Riyadh? And as you understand it, what are their most important asks? So uh, it's extremely important for Riyadh because they would like to uh, get certain guarantees from the United States. There's a fourth, by the way, or fifth uh, issue that they would like, which is a free trade agreement with the United States, in addition to the ones you've already listed. And I think they are interested in stability, and they want to move away from the ideologies of anti-imperialism and resistance to the U.S. and turmoil, uh, which has characterized much of the history of the modern Middle East uh, until recently. And so it's very important for Riyadh to um, normalize with Israel, but under certain conditions. Robert Sotloff, security guarantees from the U.S., advanced weapons from the U.S., civil nuclear uh, program with enrichment. Are these things that Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel and President Biden are willing to give Saudi Arabia? Well, Nick, so far it looks like President Biden wants to go big. He doesn't want to uh, nickel and dime on what each side is asking the other. He's trying to make a big deal that each side makes big concessions um, to each other. Um, uh, as for the Israelis, there's an internal debate uh, we're seeing uh, within the national security establishment in Israel on what types of uh, um, guarantees and benefits to the Saudis might have a negative impact on Israel's qualitative military edge. But right now, it seems as though um, Israel's uh, um, uh, political and security leaders are leaning toward accepting the big deal outlines of security guarantees and even a um, civil nuclear relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Dalia Dasake, you recently argued that this deal would not genuinely advance peace in the Middle East. In fact, it could make things worse. Why? Well, look, normalization is, of course, positive, and the U.S. should welcome it. Uh, but as the Senate piece suggested, it will be a high price and mostly paid from Washington. So this defense pact that we're talking about with the Saudis uh, or is the kind of agreement we don't even have with Israel. We tend not to have these agreements with undemocratic partners, particularly those with erratic uh, records of foreign interventions. Uh, the nuclear agreement on the table seems to go beyond the type of cooperation we have with other regional partners. So um, I think it's a quite a high price, and there's a lot of wishful thinking about the kind of gains that it could potentially bring.
And staying with you, Dalia Dasake, are there also concerns, given human rights concerns, about Saudi Arabia and its re leader, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, and is also concerns by critics in Israel uh, that certain steps that government is taking would erode the checks and balances? Well, there's always concern about uh, the Saudi domestic uh, record on human rights and continued repression, transnational repression against dissidents and so forth. This will be a particularly big issue if this comes to Congress. Uh, if this is a formal defense pact, it will require congressional ratification. There also is concern in some quarters that this could be, the timing is quite awkward because it could potentially bolster the Israeli prime minister when he is launching this assault on the independent judiciary the country when you have unprecedented protests for 35 weeks. Um, so that is another concern that comes up with the timing of this uh, particular agreement. Bernie Haeckel addressed some of those uh, arguments uh, about concerns about the promises to Saudi Arabia when it would come to especially enrichment uh, and to what Dali Dasake uh, referred to as the repression of the kingdom. You know, de facto, the United States has come to the defense of Saudi Arabia when it was threatened in 1990 by an Iraqi invasion. So I think that, in fact, the United States would come to Saudi Arabia's defense simply for, you know, geopolitical reasons and because of the oil reserves that are in that, in that country and in neighboring countries. On human rights, absolutely, the Saudis uh, don't have a good record. They have a pretty bad record. And um, that is something that the United States has raised in the past and should continue to raise. Um, I don't see how, though, a purely value, values-based foreign policy is going to advance uh, peace uh, in the Middle East or, for that matter, make the Saudis behave better. Um, if you link the Saudis to um, a normalization agreement with Israel, I think you have a better chance of um, gaining leverage on that and many other files. And finally, on the nuclear agreement, the Saudi position is the United States has effectively agreed to the Iranians uh, being allowed to enrich. So why shouldn't they be allowed to enrich? And Robert Sotloff, can, can you respond to the concerns that Dalia Dasake raised about the Israeli government uh, that are frankly being raised across Israel every night uh, through unprecedented domestic protests? Well, I think I think the answer here is is very simple. That you can't choose when moments of opportunity emerge. I think we we do a little bit of disservice to the negotiations to only call this a normalization agreement. I think what the Biden administration has in mind is something much more transformative, which which is uh, yes, at its core, um, uh, making a normal, peaceful relationship between our closest Middle East ally and uh, perhaps the most important Arab and Muslim state, Saudi Arabia. But it's even bigger than that. It has to do with deterrence against um, uh, uh, regional threats headed by Iran. And it has to do with getting our partners on the same side with us in terms of uh, the military, security, and high technology approach vis-a-vis -vis China. Dalia Dasake, are your concerns uh, assuaged, uh, perhaps, if, <laughs> if this is a truly uh, transformative deal, uh, as Robert Sotloff just said? Um, what I am questioning is what gains we will get on the strategic level. When it comes to China, this notion that this agreement can kind of help move uh, the Saudis back into the U.S. camp, move it further from the Chinese orbit, is just not in touch with the regional realities today. That countries like Saudi Arabia and others, other partners in the region don't want to take sides. They are playing all sides, and they're playing them well. When it comes to Iran, we're not going to have some, you know, unified pro-American access confronting the Iranians as much as we might like it. The Saudis themselves are normalizing and resuming relationships, diplomatic relations with Iran as we speak. And then finally, when it comes to these expectations of big wins on the Palestinian front, what Israeli government are we talking about? We are 30 years from Oslo, and we are as far as we ever have been from a two-state solution. We have time. Let's get a good agreement if we're going to normalize, and let's make sure the U.S. isn't paying an unnecessarily high price. Bernard Haeckel, let's zoom into the Palestinians uh, and their requests right now. Uh, when the United Arab Emirates normalized with Israel, they agreed uh, with the Trump administration and the Israeli government that the Israeli government would not pursue annexation for a number of years. Uh, will the Saudis ask for even more than that? And in general, how important uh, are the Palestinian requests uh, to this overall conversation for the Saudis? So I think the Saudis will ask for 
um, a certain freezing of settlements and the removal of certain settlements that are deemed illegal, um, even under Israeli law, I think. Um, but but to, to be honest, I don't think the Palestinian um, issue is central to this, uh, to this agreement uh, from the Saudi perspective. Saudi Arabia is at the moment pursuing a policy where national interests, the national interests of the kingdom are first and foremost uh, in, in, in terms of strategic thinking. I do want to add one thing, which is that the Saudis uh, can and will uh, do things that are uh, deeply troubling for American interests, strategic interests, not just becoming closer uh, to, the, to the Chinese, but they can also start uh, selling oil in, uh, in currencies that are not the U.S. dollar. And that would be a serious attack on the, on the status of the dollar as a global reserve currency. So the Saudis do have a number of um, cards that they can play uh, eventually if U.S.-Saudi relations are not put on a much more secure footing, which they have not been uh, under this administration. Rob Satloff, last word. What are the chances of this coming to fruition? And, and uh, as has been mentioned, uh, can a deal get through Congress if, in fact, it needs to? Uh, well, there's a, a remarkable effort by the administration for something which um, stands only about a 50-50 chance given all the, the moving parts of this deal. But they are putting, uh, the White House is putting a lot of effort into it, and they believe that if there is a uh, an Israeli security component that goes with a Saudi security component, that this is something they can bring to the Senate, and they believe that they can get the two-thirds majority in the Senate. Uh, for approval for treaties that would set a new um, a new baseline for our relations in the Middle East. Robert Satloff, Bernard Haeckel, Dalia Dasake, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.